I'm going to speak for a few minutes, if you don't mind, on the subject of the future and the future of youth and the future of youth well beyond our borders, let alone inside our borders, and trying to influence uh, our youth and our young people to engage uh, worldwide. We've all been hearing a lot about the 150th anniversary of this uh, very unique uh, democracy, one of the most stable in the world. You've been hearing also every now and again about Vimy Ridge and how your peers, those 18 to 21, 22, some of them 17 and so on, uh, went across the big pond and fought and died uh, at Vimy Ridge to move us from being a, a sort of colonial cousin to actually a nation state uh, and paid that in blood, young people. And it's always amazing that the young people are the one that we send out and they're in the front lines of what we want to do internationally in so many cases, yet the, the young people don't vote to engage themselves in making sure those decisions make sense. Uh, because of all the young people in this country, uh, below 25, uh, there's nearly 2.9 million votes and barely, barely 20% of them vote. And if they all voted, they would actually hold the balance of power in this country. The young people hold votes that have never been used. So if they voted, they could shift the whole nature of our uh, political structure in the country. So you are empowered with the ability to change significantly if you could get together and coalesce. And why I raise that is because we're in an era where we sort of stumbled into uh, a complete different world after the Cold War in the 90s and into the now the new millennium. We, we've stumbled into an era of significant change. And because of that, uh, there's been an enormous amount of opportunities either lost or not really grasped to the maximum. The example is that 150th. It would have been a great opportunity to actually articulate by the political elite of this country the vision of the future. Not just think of what we did in the past, but actually use this as a start point for the future. Now from here, what do we do globally? Because contrary to every other time, we actually can be global. We never were before global, but now we can be global. We can actually Skype soon anybody on the planet. We can actually communicate real time. And so with that ability and that extraordinary technological revolution, we should be maximizing it. As we face the other revolutions, like the environmental revolution, which just starting, where we have to make a communion between the people, the humanity, and the planet, so that the planet and humanity will thrive, not survive, thrive. That's what we want. We're not here survivalists. We want to thrive. We want to push the limits and continue to grow. We also have concerns on security and security and how it's influencing and how it's being influenced by a whole variety of factors out there that are not what they used to be. They're not necessarily nationalism or power structures between nation states. On the contrary, some of the extremists, like ISIS, don't even have borders. And so in this particular year of starting up, if we were thinking of a vision, the adults could have brought out some, some interesting initiatives to bring us even closer together. One of the ideas I had is I, I said, why don't we replicate what we did 150 years ago? Why don't we build a high-speed train from Halifax to Vancouver? Because 150 years ago, when we built that train, that was high speed then. So why not? It, and if it takes 40 years, fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's an engineering problem. But imagine how it can bring us much tighter together than, in fact, how we see uh, the air systems going. And so maybe a complete reconciliation of a, of a whole new order with the First Nations, with the uh, Inuit, with the Métis. There's over a million in this country, throughout the country. Why not rebuild a capability so we see a value added of our synergy together? Them so close to, the, to nature and us often so far away from nature and simply using it. Imagine if we could marry that up. And so, so those are maybe a couple adult things, but what about the young people? The ones who are actually gonna carry the can into the future. What about them? Well, one of the great advantages 
that they have is they actually master a tool that none of us had before. This generation, the under 25, the even under 20s, have an ability to go global. You are, in fact, global. All those communications tools that you're using in social media are global. My son used to war game between a kid in Moscow and one in Rio. To him, they were next door. You are global. You got the power to use it globally. You can coalesce in real time and move significantly any sort of idea or concept. But it, might, it needs people to master it, to give it focus, to give it a guidance. And that's what that vision could have given. Could have given us a grander design of where do we, you, where do we use this country, is Canada, in the global environment? What can it do to advance humanity, to continue the advancement of us uh, to thrive? And we didn't get that. So it is very much in the hands of you, the young people, to articulate the absolute essentiality of getting that focus and moving beyond our borders. And that's, to me, an element fundamental to the future. Because in so many countries in the world, your peers are the ones who are, in fact, absorbing and actually becoming the victims, let alone being destroyed by decisions of adults in many of the conflicts around the world. The creation of the idea of using children as weapons of war. Children fighting adult wars. Before we didn't have children in wars because of their age. Now because of their age, we do have them in wars. From 8 to 18. And we built a lot of laws and, and instruments to try to protect them. But there's been not much in the field to actually implement it. So how do we actually get it mobile? How do we influence the situation? When I saw how the young militia that started off as a little youth party sort of group that attached to a, a political party and how over the period of seven months with radio and communications and events and so on, how they were radicalized and became a militia that in fact led the slaughter of 800,000 people. The whole ability to move that massive amount, when you look at the demographics of the world in many countries where the population, 50% of the population is under 15. So there's a, a massive number of people to come and to be able to influence it. So that's why after witnessing what happened there, nobody's stopping it. I went to Harvard, did my research, and since then I've been at Dal Dalhousie, and we've created an initiative with a whole new doctrinal, a whole new structure, how to train militaries and police forces so that they can actually prevent the recruitment of children and make their use ineffective. If we can make the children a liability, people won't recruit them. And to make them a liability doesn't mean by killing them, which is the only thing going on out there in Syria, in the Congo, in South Sudan. Somalia, Central African Republic, and how much even in Colombia did they do? There is around the world over 51 organizations and in over 17 conflicts where we are seeing tens and tens of thousands of children being the primary weapon, of which 40% are girls. And they're used in everything from up front gun to gun all the way through to supporting and ultimately even sex slaves and bushwives. Adults are using kids to conduct these wars. There's something fundamentally morally corrupt with the world of permitting that. And so they're screaming for peer support. Those kids need references out there to get them out, to help them not get recruited. And so we're engaged in training all these armies and these police forces. All the 110,000 peacekeepers that are out there, every five, six months they change around. For every peacekeeper in the field, you've got five who are in preparation for training and on leave and so on. We're talking half a million peacekeepers at any one time to train them, to make them more effective in reducing the capabilities of people to recruit children and also to give the ability of children to recognize how not to get sucked in, how not to be used, and ultimately how to, in fact, Stay safe. 
And that's the essence of my life. And I believe you can be engaged. I believe there should be a sort of a rite of passage in a great country like ours, one of the 11 most powerful nations in the world. We have a responsibility beyond our borders. And I think what we can do is have this rite of passage that says that after an undergrad degree maybe, or even high school, that we have to have a pair of sneakers or boots under your bed that have been sold in the earth of a developing country, where you've seen where 80% of humanity is living, where you see it, you hear it, you smell it, you taste it, you feel it, and you come back after weeks or months, and you keep that in your mind. You keep that flame that got ignited of how you have been insulted by seeing the poverty and the abuse of your peers and create the capability to join in the efforts to prevent their recruitment. Create your own NGO, coalesce, communicate. Use the extraordinary force multiplier that you have now, that we never had. And that is that revolution of communications and the ability to go overseas relatively cheaply. Sort of like a sophisticated bus ride to get over there. And so, yeah, we can stop the use of children as weapons of war if we got an engagement. And so I think, my bottom line is, I didn't have any problems in 1967, 100th anniversary, building hockey rinks, centennial rinks, or parks. Sure, of course. But I think we can do better this time. I think we can take the government of this country and the youth of this country getting out there and take the government of this country and say, why don't you lead in this whole movement of trying to reduce the impact of war on children, children caught up in armed conflict? Why don't you lead the world in trying with others and trying to eliminate that and doing it without the slaughter of those children and the impact it has on those peacekeepers who have to come home after having used lethal force against a child. I had a sergeant who met me, He'd done five tours. He was back four years and still was not able to hug his children for what he had to do overseas. These moral and ethical dilemmas are blowing their minds. So why don't we lead the pack? Why doesn't this country, why doesn't our young prime minister, minister of youth, take this on, bring a couple other countries on board, and we say, we are going to move with the youth of my own nation and with our capabilities and resources. We are going to move the world to eradicate the use of children as weapons of war and in fact, even make it unthinkable. Then, then I will say, the world is advancing and is not mortgaging a generational continuum of war as we're seeing so much of today. Thank you very much.